and thanks for tuning in to the Path 11 Podcast. I am your host, April Hanna. At the Path 11 Podcast, we are here trying to deliver leading-edge research on consciousness, healing, and metaphysics. And just like you, we are trying to answer the big questions about life. Who are we? Why are we here? And what is our purpose? We hope by listening to our podcast, it will make each day you live on Earth a little easier to understand. And now for today's podcast. Hi, everyone. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest today. I have Elua Arthur, and she is a death doula attorney and the founder of Going With Grace, which is an end-of-life planning organization that exists to support people as they answer the question, what must I do to be at peace with myself so that I may live presently and die peacefully? From private end-of-life consultations and public education about death to online coursework to train death doulas, she is tirelessly committed to bringing awareness to death and dying. She passionately believes considering death can inspire the way people live. Elua, welcome to the Path 11 podcast. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you all today. Yeah, same here. So we actually found out about you and the work that you're doing um, because we are connected to the Afterlife Awareness Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah for 2019. And you are one of the presenters. I am. Yes. So, and I know that um, your presentation is actually one of the three hour workshops that, and those workshops are not included in the live stream. We basically record the breakout sessions, the panel discussions and things of that sort. Um, But yours is a presentation on conscious dying. It's three hours and people actually get uh, three continuing ed credits, which is pretty cool for people who have license. They have to keep up on their education and things of that sort. So we're, we're pretty excited um, Um, to talk with you today. Uh, I have just been learning about death doulas in this past year, a year and a half or so. I never knew that they existed. I am so excited that they exist. And I love one of the things that you say on your website where you say, um, if you talk about sex, you're not going to get pregnant. And if we talk about death, you're not going to die. So uh, I love it. So welcome. And maybe you can give our audience a little bit more of your background. Sure. And how you came to become a death doula. Okay. Uh, let's see. So I've been doing this work now for about five years, formally. I came into the awareness of death, my own and that of the people around me, about six years ago. You know, it's something that we all know is going to happen at some point. But for some, it takes an event or a moment or somebody nearby getting ill before it really begins to sink in that one day we're going to, in fact, die. I think a lot we, we know that it's going to happen because it's the only certainty in life, but it's It's like this strange thing that kind of sits over there that only unless our attention is directed toward it, we ever take the time to look at it. And that happened for me when I was on a bus in Cuba. I met a woman who was just a couple years older than I was at the time. She was German and she had uterine cancer. And so she was on a trip to see the top six places in the world she wanted to see before she died. And during that bus ride, I remember... You know, looking at her kind of curiously, thinking, wow, she has this very serious illness that kills people all the time. And she was on this trip because she wanted to see places before she actually died, thinking that the disease might kill her. So I started asking her questions about her life. And that segued into questions about her death. What did it mean? What would be left undone in her life if this disease, in fact, killed her? What has her life meant? What was she going to do with her clothing and her jewelry? What about all the photographs she was taking on this trip? And during that time, I was looking around and I was like, she's going to die. Everybody on this bus is going to die. I'm going to die. <laughs> it seems like this, everybody's going to die. Why are we not behaving like it? Why do we not talk about it? Why is it a big secret? And that's the first time that I really started to think about death in any meaningful way. And then about, let's see, I spent some time after that trying to find a way into death work because I was pretty clear that this is what I was going to do with my life. And then my brother-in-law, about a year later, got sick. And then shortly afterward, he died. And I was there with my sister and him for the last two months of his life. And during that time is when the lack of support that we have for families when a death is occurring um, or when dying is present, that's when it really became clear to me And it also became very clear to me how I could, what my role could be. 
So I started going with Grace, which is an end of life planning and support organization that supports people as they answer very serious questions for themselves and get themselves prepared for death. Um, so I've been doing going with Grace now for about five years. Um, let's see, I'm a lawyer. And so I started my professional career practicing law. But as soon as I, as soon as actually I came back from Cuba, I was pretty clear that this is all I was going to be doing. And I haven't been back to the practice of law since then. <laughs> Go figure. Wow. So what a gift she gave you on mm. that bus, you know? That's such, I mean, it was a massive gift. My brother-in-law as well. It's hard to think of somebody's death as a gift to us personally, but it was being allowed to be present in the room with him, be there in his most vulnerable moments. I don't think I've ever felt more honored as when somebody invites me into their dying. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was on your blog on your website and I love it because, you know, it's, it's more like a YouTube video. You get to see you and there's like mm -hmm. these short little minute things. But one of the ones that really touched me and I was like, yeah, good point. You said, why do we feel entitled to our next birthday? W you know, what is this entitlement that we have to life? And I was like, yes, yes. <laughs> you know, right. I know. And, you know, even thinking about that for myself, like, yeah, I definitely have felt entitled to continue to live. And of course, I'm going to live until I'm 75. And I just love that you said, why do we think that? You know, we why are we so entitled to thinking that we're going to live these long lives or make it to our next birthday? So I would just love to hear you speak on that some more, because that was just right on. I loved it. Thank you. Well, it's also it like constantly shocks me. You know, because the, the bigger picture is that we often think of death as something that has taken things away from us, you know, like something that we are entitled to have. Yet every breath that we have is a gift. To experience life in and of itself is a gift because we're not entitled to it. Nobody promised me anything when I was born. And even if they did, it wouldn't be true. One of the one of like the deep mysteries that I really enjoy when thinking about death is that nothing is promised except for the fact that it will come when we don't know where we don't know under what circumstances we don't know why I don't know. But I do know that at some point I'm going to die. And so if I can have gratitude for what I have had so far rather than expect that I'm going to make it to where I'm going this evening or like, I'm not entitled to dinner. I'm not entitled to lunch. It's only 11 a.m. in L.A. I'm not entitled to anything. So the little bit that I get, I can celebrate and feel grateful for. Um, and death is useful in that reminder of practicing gratitude rather than entitlement and expectation. Yeah. And I also love what, what you say too, about like the reason why you talk about death and want to do, uh, this work is because life inspires you. You're inspired by living, you know? So let's, let's talk about that. I love life. It's so juicy, but you know, sometimes I hear people say that they don't want to die because they love life so much, but that always kind of trips me out because that suggests a separation between life and death that death is not a part of life, that death is something else. But just like birth is what makes life come about, death is the end point of it, but it is a part of the whole journey. You can't love something and not love it all the way through its end, otherwise it's conditional. It's not, it's not real love, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like if, yeah, I can't say I love life, but these parts I can do without, it doesn't work that way. Death is a part of the game. And so in order to really love life, we have to also appreciate and like love death. That's what gives any of this any meaning. Now, some of the work that you do too, when I was on your website, taking a look at the workshops, you have a workshop called Awakening Workshop. Yeah. And that's uh, designed for people to contemplate the reality of your body's inevitable death. So as... And again, I'm still, like I said, I'm still learning about the role of death doulas and, um, you know, what they provide. But I, this to me seems like I could attend this workshop, I, even though I'm in full health, I don't have a diagnosis. I'm not at this, well, we're dying every day, right? But at this moment, I'm not really, I don't have to answer those hard questions with that type of diagnosis right now. So awakening workshop would be for, um, just anyone that wants to start talking about death and begin to contemplate that and, and look at all of those feelings that it could evoke, um, could 
Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, a, a good portion of my work is with healthy people. Okay. Uh, surprisingly, yeah, I work with a bunch of healthy people to start getting their affairs in order. So we do some practical preparation for the end of life. I create comprehensive end of life plans. And what happens is that when people start to come into some awareness that their lives are going to end one day, even though they don't yet know what it is that they're going to be dying of, I think that's the only real difference between those of us that we contemplate or we think of as healthy and my clients that know what it is likely that's going to kill them is the awareness of what it is that's going to kill them. Um, so I help people make comprehensive end of life plans. And so a lot of healthy people also come to these workshops where we get to sit deep in what if, what if, because what if might actually be the case. It might be sooner than, it might be later than, but like we were just talking about a minute ago, we don't know. So workshops are for healthy people. End of life planning is definitely for healthy people. Meditating on death is for healthy people. Just thinking about death is on for healthy people. Right. <laughs> Not just, yeah. A death is a part, you know, I think, a big misconception about the work is that we sit bedside and sing songs and wait for death to occur. While that is some of it, there is a lot more that the role encompasses. And um, I'm doing my best to make it as universally um, useful as possible. Yeah. And, and that's pretty much my, that was my first assumption in hearing about it. I, I kind of was envisioning that a death doula is, is someone that's just more integrated in the process of dying alongside of hospice, you know, um, that they, they help in that process and in that way. But the more that I'm learning about it and learning about you and the work that you're doing, it's like, yeah, no, it's for everyone. And, and you're so right in what you said in the beginning of the podcast too. It's like, why aren't we talking about this? Why are we're all living here, but we're kind of acting like it's not really going to happen. There aren't open conversations about it. I can't tell you how many people have said, who, I don't want to talk about death. No way. Don't, that's so negative. I don't even want to think about it. Um, and maybe this can go into my next question. When I was on your workshop page, um, you have a note about the workshops and that there is a true name for a phobia for people who have a phobia of death. Yeah. And how you said like this, this may not be the workshop for you. So right. maybe can we talk a little bit about um, the phobia of death and how real that is, you know, for some people and, um, and maybe just getting some thoughts on, on why some of your thoughts on that. Oh gosh. It makes sense to me that it's scary. You know, we don't, it doesn't give us any of the comforts that we're used to in life. It's, it's completely outside of anything that we can really conceive of. I think, think even for people that have, some strong spiritual or religious beliefs, there is still a question mark, right? Because it's just a belief until it's been tested and it's not tested until the moment we die. And it, it calls so much of who we are into question when thinking about our death. It's uncomfortable, admittedly. I don't think that it's all glitter and rainbows and unicorns. I mean, it might be, I don't know, because I haven't done it as far as I recall. But what I do know, <laughs> but what I do know is that when we spend some time with the discomfort, the benefits are so great. The fears of death are, they are, when I, they're broken up into about four major categories as far as I see. The first is a big fear of the unknown. What's going to happen? What's over there? Is there a there at all? What's it going to feel like? The second major fear of death is a uh, fear of the process of the body. Is it going to be painful? What's it going to feel like? Third one is what, well, we all know is FOMO, the fear of missing out, that life is going to continue on without me. My kids are going to grow. I'm not going to see them. Um, technology will grow. People will go live on the moon, and I won't be around to experience it. And then the last major one is the fear of a life not fully lived, that I haven't gotten enough out of life. I don't want to die yet because I still have to write my book or I have yet to have children and get married or all the other things that we still want to do. So those are some of the major categories as far as I have been able to tell. And no matter what the major fear is, there's a, there's a way to work with it right now. You know, like most fears, they do exposure therapy, right? You do a little bit at a time to get you a little bit closer. I can't take you a little bit closer to death, but well, I can just by virtue of you living and breathing every day, 
but we also can by starting to contemplate it, spend some time with it, and look at what the root of the fear is. Because uh, if the root of the fear is a life not fully lived, then what is left undone? And what are you waiting for? Right? right. If it's a fear of pain and the process of the body, well, make a plan for how you want to handle pain. How do you handle your pain now? Do you fear getting a headache now? How do you deal with it when you get a headache? There are things that we can do to start working with our fear of death. Great. Thank you uh, for right. that. I think that was that was a great, great explanation. Um also, you have a really beautiful video on your website. The first time I, I saw it was actually on Instagram, um, your Instagram video where you're working with a family. You were called to come. You sat at a table with a family. It looked like you were working with the mom and her kids were there. And I remember in the video you were saying, like, a lot of people think, God, your work must be so sad. And you say, well, we do a lot of laughing, too, you know. And yeah. and uh, But I have to say, when I watched that video, I felt like I was a part of of, you know, their conversation and sitting at the table with them. But it also felt, it did feel not sad, but you could just read the emotion on, on the children's faces, you know, sitting there hearing it, but then also seeing them smile. And it was just like a mixture of emotion when I was watching it about how this process unfolds and the relief and in hearing your parent in that situation, being able to, you know, talk about all the things that they want. And then, you know, but to also also see like, yeah, but we're really talking about this. This is a reality. Yeah. Um, so maybe you can also, uh, let people know that this isn't all doom and gloom and, you know, it's not like you have a depressing job because you're talking about death and those, you know, maybe you could talk about that beautiful aspect about how there are a lot of laughs and this is kind of a very positive process that people go through. Incredibly. It is dense for sure. It is an emotionally dense job, but it is not dark. In fact, it's really light. So often when I'm with people nearing the end of life after a death occurs, one of the major things that they talk about is the beauty that they experienced. Yes, there's sadness. Yes, there's loss. Yes, there's grief. But in the midst of it all, there's tremendous beauty to be able to hold the space and the body of somebody that you've loved so much in life, walking them through this last major act. There. When contemplating death also, when, well, let me talk about the practical aspect. There's a lot of relief that's given when you know finally what your mom wants done with her body or with her things or how she feels about life support because those aren't questions anymore. They're tough to talk about, undoubtedly. But once the answers are out there, it's so much easier than it is when we just don't know. Really also, I find that when talking to somebody about their death, I learn a lot about who they are as a person, like what their life is like. And it's fun doing that with parents and kids in particular because they uncover so much about each other, but also, you know, people, they kind of needle each other about the little sticky parts about their personality, both the fun ones and the challenging ones, because it's all up for grabs when we're talking about death. You know, <laughs> my mom says, under no circumstances am I to be without lipstick. I don't care what else is going on. Just make sure you put my lipstick on. And I'm like, Ma, are you serious? Like, you're going to be on your deathbed. She's just like, Ayla, you know me well enough. Do not <laughs> let me be there without lipstick on. But I know her. That's who she is. That's okay. who she's been. Mm -hmm. It's okay. It's kind of um, cute. It feels warm. I guess that's the best way I can describe it. It's dense emotionally. But it's not heavy. It's not sad. Yeah. And, you know, as being a trained mental health therapist too, I feel like families that go through the process, having a death doula, my gosh, you, you can take out so many different psychological components, or maybe we could call them psychological hangovers after a person dies of all of these, what if questions that I do it right? I don't know what he or she would want. There wasn't anything in writing. I mean, all of that pain that people go through. I mean, so I just feel like that this is also in preparation for really healthy mental health. Um, and, you know, part of the grieving process that really can help that entire 
that grief process that people go through. I think I don't want to say that you're, you don't skip over an element when you have this in place, but and that that grieving is still going to be there. But sometimes as therapists, we are digging through the many, many different layers. And I feel like as everyone is alive and talking about this, these layers are being worked on beforehand and can be resolved when the person finally is ready to grieve the physical body of that person. You just dropped the bomb on me. I'm going to definitely borrow the psychological hangover concept, if you don't mind, <laughs> because that's that has a lot to do with it. When we can talk about it beforehand, the, the what if questions are not so great. They always exist, right? They always exist because we can't possibly cover every component. But by and large, if you know that your mother or somebody that you cared about very much died or the end of their life look like how they wanted. Granted, can't control the circumstances, can't control whether or not it's going to be colorectal cancer or heart disease. But we do know maybe that she wanted to be at home and she wanted to have the cat in the bed with her. We can do that. Mm -hmm. That does bring so much greater peace. And it does, I think, create um, pathways for grieving that you don't have to get over the psychological hangover. I generally call them psychological speed bumps to get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing too, just in looking at all of the services that you do provide, I mean, you need to know a lot of stuff. There's a lot involved in what you can offer people. You know, I mean, you even have a specific session section on financial planning. And, you know, it's like, oh, there's another sticky subject. Who wants to talk about money? What do we do with that? Um, you have a list on compassionate completions. And I'm looking at all of this stuff. I'm like, oh, my gosh, thank God there are people like you out there. I don't even know what half of the, some of this stuff is, you know, probate support, <laughs> finan you know, account closures, um, just credit bureau not notifications. Gosh, wouldn't even I wouldn't even have thought of that, you know. But yeah. these are all things that, especially when you're grieving, who can who can remember half of this stuff? So, like, who yeah. wants to sit at the DMV anyway? But right. especially <laughs> when you're in the midst of deep grief, like no one, you right. know. And these things can be a real pain in the neck, and just they keep it like just eh, 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 pushing, pushing, pushing those really soft, sore points when you have to say 50 times over on the phone, my brother died, my brother died, my brother died. That's why I'm calling you. I need to close his accounts. I need to cancel a cell phone. I need to, I need to, I need to. It's a lot. And so it's very useful to have somebody who's detached from the grief who can support in that way. Or at least, I mean, if I'm not going to do all the services for my person, I will at least give them a very clear roadmap about how to do that, and then also give them suggestions and tips on how to work around the obstacles that they will in inevitably face. Yeah. yeah. There is a lot to learn. I mean, it's not, you know, there is a beautiful, juicy, heartfelt component, which we all have that wisdom already, but there are, there are some things that are useful to learn, and gratefully I spent, you know, five years perfecting the practice so that now I can teach it to people that want to do it and make it a little easier. Yeah. And I, I noticed too, in your video, you were talking and educating some people look like at a workshop about what happens when the body dies. And I, are you also gathering information about like green burials and how to be more compassionate to the earth, uh, you know, and how to dispose of the body and different options that people can take that maybe aren't the traditional cremations or, um, you know, actually buying the casket and burying people in a cemetery. Um, cause I know that that's been a new thing too. We interviewed a couple of people about that. And that was all brand new information. I didn't even know some of these services um, existed and just trying to take care of our earth a little bit more because a lot happens with the decomposition decomposition of the body. Um, I always thought, oh, well, maybe cremation is the best way to go. And then I had no idea about that whole process too of what gets released out into the air, you know, how much uh, fire and, and stuff that it takes and the whole process of that too. So I just, it's just a question. I don't know if you know a lot about that or if you you also educate people about that as well. Yeah, we do educate people about that. I mean, it's also been a big part of the learning I had to undergo in order to adequately be able to support people. When it comes to, I mean, you mentioned financial planning just a minute ago and like uh, funeral options, all the rest. When thinking about death and trying to support people through death, 
I think it's wildly important to know like the whole industry around it, all the different facets of the industry. One thing that I find really beautiful about the role of the death doula is that we can understand all of them and from a bird's eye view, give you options, support, knowledge, resources in order to handle them. What, how my work came about was when my brother-in-law died, I remember sitting there in the midst of grief, trying to figure out how to do something that seemed so simple. If I could only ask somebody, it, I didn't, I spent hours researching on the internet in grief, trying to understand how to transfer title of his car. And I thought, I know that somebody has done this before. Somebody knows how to do this. Who can I call? And there was no one. There was no one. I couldn't find anybody. There was nobody at the hospice, the, at the hospital. There was no space for it at the funeral home. Nobody knew how to handle it. I was like, this is ridiculous. If only there were people, if only there were people that knew all the things around how to handle this death, that would help me out a lot. And so I became the people and now I'm training a bunch more other people to do it. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit more about the training course that you offer? Gladly. Um, it's really the thing that I'm most juiced about right now because it's been so much fun to kind of coordinate and bring together all the things that I've learned, all the mistakes I've made, and um, all the, the easy ways I've found to do things over the past five years and offer that to people that also want to do this. Um, it's a 12-week online course, so people from actually seven different countries are taking it currently. And uh, I go through all of the major parts about being with death. Not only do we start off with our personal relationships with death, because I feel that for people that are supporting other people through it, we have to get very clear on what our own beliefs are just to make sure we're not bleeding over other people. And then we go into the medical system. We look at signs of dying. We talk about um, what, what death actually looks like. Uh, we move into... Um, how to work with the dead, natural death care, taking care of a body at home. Uh, we talk about the funeral industry, burial options, legacy, funerals themselves, how to create legacy projects, um, advanced planning. Oh, gosh, what comes after advanced planning? Oh, everything beyond the advanced directive, all the planning portions, um, end of life options. Then we move into wrapping up affairs after somebody dies and then grief and bereavement and then um, how to build a practice for yourself and then self-care. So wow. in 12 weeks, yeah, in 12 weeks, we look at really all of the things. It's all dense. It's a very, very dense course. But my intention was to create a beautiful tool bag that people that are interested in doing this work can look at all the tools, spend some time with all of them, and then find out the ones that are most sharp for them or the ones that they're most drawn to and go out there and sharpen the stuffing out of them and then <laughs> go give that to the world. Yeah, that sounds very comprehensive. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm seeing, too, that death doulas, they are becoming um, – I don't know if mainstream is the right word yet, but, you know, people are talking about them more. And, you know, if somebody is looking to be trained in this, uh, you know, what do you think is very important that should not be missed in a training course like this? And I'm sure yours covers it. And, you know, is there anything that you specifically put in to your training that you feel is unique? I think what's unique in my training is the practical preparation you know, because we talk a lot about what people need. And that's how I built a practice, to be honest with you. Um, I I took a death midwifery course. It was fantastic through Olivia Barham at Sacred Crossings here in Los Angeles. I took it and then was like, y'all, I'm a death midwife. I'm a death doula. And nobody came. And only once I started offering services that people actually needed and offered skills that people thought that they should pay for, did people start paying? And I was able to build a practice and build a business that um, supports my lifestyle. Yeah. So it, it requires, I think it requires skills, practical skills, because we all have the innate wisdom about being with dying. We need kindness and compassion and listening and empathy. Um, we know how to do that. We don't practice it enough in our regular lives. And so when somebody's dying, let me tell you, our the top of the pops can come out, right. but <laughs> it takes, it takes skills to know how to do the rest. So the practical stuff is really juicy. And I think the practical, which is layered with the emotional and even deeper than that, the spiritual is how we're able to be with dying in a way that um, 
I think the public will recognize as a valuable and legitimate role. Because right now there's some like, you know, there's this trendy thing, y'all are sitting around singing Kumbaya and lighting candle, candles. But in truth, when I can tell you how to navigate a credit bureau, um, that that's something somebody is willing to support. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, and not only that, too, but even I would assume that every family that you teach and help, they then become a resource for their friends, other family members, their coworkers, you know, and can help others. So it's kind of like, you know, the gift that keeps on giving, where once you learn and know how to do that, now you also have something more valuable to offer somebody through that grieving process themselves if they end up not hiring a death doula. This is my dream. Yes that somebody, people will learn how to do this and then be able to do it for other people in their community and in their homes and in the neighborhood. Like just, let's just spread the love as far as it will go because we all know somebody that's going to die. Even if we're not comfortable with the idea of ourselves dying, we know somebody that's going to die. So let's support them because we generally feel very helpless when that happens. But if you can learn how to do it in a way that's effective and useful, man, you empowered yourself, you empowered them. Like, let's spread the love. Let's spread the love. Yeah. Now, now I know your courses are available to anyone all over the world. Um, Your consultation services. So, you know, I live in New York. We have listeners from all over the world as well. Um, Are you just primarily working with people in the Los Angeles area or are you open for um, other consultations from different states or how does that work? Everywhere. I do a lot of my consultations online, actually. So when we're doing end of life planning consultations, I have a document, uh, about a 40 page document I work with, that I'll mail to the family or whoever I'm working with. And then we'll do the consultation over the internet. And then like via Skype or Zoom or some other live feature. Um, when somebody's getting close to the end of life, I also do that largely over the internet. Uh, sometimes I fly to the location if necessary and if the family has the means in order to make that happen or if I'm going to be in the area. So I'd say only about 15% of my work is local. Most of it is, thank God, through the gift of technology, I'm able to work with people no matter where they are. Oh, that's great to know. I mean, I, I'm thinking about a, a client of mine too, where their father, their father is uh, fallen quite ill and he has a ton of assets that, you know, in order for him to be Medicaid eligible, he has to start, you know, moving some things here and there, but he also has assets in a totally different country, wow. you know, and the daughters are like, okay, we got to figure this out, you know, yes. in, Port- in Portugal. So I, have you ever run up with, run into stuff like that? That's like super complicated and, you know, how to help people when, you know, their dying loved one does have stuff in a totally different country. And I mean, I'm sure all of that paperwork is just something, I don't know, overwhelming and and different as well. But are those things that you are also able to help people with? You know, I don't know the, yes, that is something that we're able to help people with. One thing that I really appreciate about my work is that curiosity underwrites it all, right? And so when I hear something like that, I think immediately, oh, there has to be an answer. Let me see if I can find it for them, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I'm going to hit the ground running and see if I can find the answer for them. Um, I use curiosity as a baseline for everything when thinking about what happens as death occurs, but also how to solve these complex problems for people near the end of life. How do we do it? There has to be an answer. Let's find the way that's going to work best for you. Yeah. Yeah. But I also want to say that one thing that I'm really enjoying about training people now is that I'm creating a network of people that know the same, that have the same knowledge that I do, that I can um, connect with folks in the neighborhood, which is nice. Right. Building that network. I'm sure. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's fun. Now, um, before we let you go in a few minutes here, I know I really want to try to convince you to stay at the afterlife awareness conference longer and be one of the hour and 15 minute breakout sessions so people can see you on our live stream. But, um, I want you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, what are you planning on? What does it mean to teach conscious dying and what is your workshop going to be about at the afterlife awareness conference? Exciting. So I'm going to focus on, Most of the things that we need to think about before death, 
um, not only think about, but also feel through. So we're going to do some end of life planning, um, DNRs, pulse forms, advanced directives, end of life options. Uh, but then we're also going to talk about how to have family conversations about impending death. Um, we're also going to look at things like the energy realms as death approaches, how things shift in the space, uh, in the person, but also in the environment as death is approaching, any rituals that we can do when death is approaching, how to create a space um, that is, well, death will occur anyway, but a space that might feel better to the person. And um, anticipatory grief, um, which is all the grief that we experience before the death actually occurs. It's a very real phenomenon, but people often overlook it because it doesn't quite have a name, or at least that they know. So we're going to look at how to consciously be in the space prior to a death. And then Tara Nastis is going to pick it up um, about after a death in the afternoon. Okay. Tara Nastis from the Conscious Dying Institute. Yeah. So the, the participants actually attending with that stuff that you were talking about with, uh, you know, the DNR, they're going to make some of those decisions for themselves there. Yes. And they're also going to learn how to support other people in doing it. Wow. Okay. Great. Yeah. And it's going to be rich. Yeah. <laughs> No kidding. I, and I know that you also have, it looks like I haven't had a chance um, to read it myself, but you do have a Going With Grace Guide to Completion on your website. Um, that's an e-workbook for wrapping up the affairs of your loved ones. So to, to me, that sounds like you've put everything pretty much in this workbook that people can use as a reference. Yes, I have. Beautiful. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. my best out here. Yeah. The knowledge is accessible as possible. Yes. Well, Elula, this was wonderful. Thank you so much for being a guest on the Path Love and Podcast. For our listeners, her website is goingwithgrace.com. And as you heard, she does a lot of her work online. Give her a call. Call her up if you have questions. Uh, better yet, come meet her in person. Come on down to Salt Lake City, Utah, and you know, be with us in June at the Afterlife Awareness Conference. Um, if you would like to take her workshop, you will have to buy a ticket to be in person at the Afterlife Awareness Conference. And their website is afterlifeconference.com. You can find that there. And for those of you who want to take a look at some of the breakout sessions, we will provide that via our live stream. And you can find that at path11productions.com. So thanks again so much. It was wonderful to speak with you. Thank you. This was a lot of fun for me, too. Have a great day. Thanks for listening to the Path 11 podcast today. I hope you all enjoyed this show. And if you haven't checked out our Patreon page, I'd like you to do so because we are going to start putting some content over there that is only for our Patreon subscribers. You can get content for as little as donating a dollar a month, and it could just be a one-time donation. We have other freebies over there that you can get depending upon how much you would like to donate. And again, it could be a one-time donation, or you can continue to keep your subscription on a monthly basis at that donation level, but I just put my MBT immersive experience, which was a four day, four day intensive meditation training in Tennessee with physicist Tom Campbell. I was listening to binaural beats, going to altered states of consciousness, having out of body experiences and life changing experiences that I was able to bring back uh, for myself, for my clients, for my friends that was just out of this world. So if you would like to listen to that, I'd like you to head on over to path11podcast.com. You're going to see an orange button that says Patreon. Become a Patreon today and you can have access to that podcast. And I would like to remind you to head on over to path11productions.com and check out the membership that we have for the Afterlife Awareness Conference. We have over 25 hours of footage with amazing speakers like William Buhlman, Thomas John, Terry Daniel, Suzanne Geisman, Suzanne Northrup, Linda Fitch, uh, Austin Wells, just a few people uh, to name off that were amazing. These workshops are just so valuable. So I think that you would really enjoy it. It's also a great thing to think about to maybe give the gift to somebody who is struggling with grief. If you are looking for resources, this is a great conference to send people to to check out. And thanks again for listening today. Mm -hmm.